I'm Cody Daigle Oriens, and welcome to StoryFest 2020. Due to the ongoing impacts of the coronavirus pandemic, StoryFest 2020 is going virtual. From September 15th through September 29th, StoryFest will premiere 13 live and pre recorded author events featuring top authors and creators in genre fiction, comics, young adult fiction, and middle grade fiction. This year, we have over 50 authors joining us from all across the country, and in cross-genre panels, they will explore the big ideas at the heart of telling stories in today's world. Even though we can't welcome you to the Libraries Forum in person, we're glad to have you with us virtually. Thanks for being here, and enjoy StoryFest 2020. Alexis Daria is a native New Yorker and award-winning author writing stories about successful Latinx characters and their occasionally messy familias. Her debut, Take the Lead, won the 2018 Rita Award for Best First Book and was one of the best romance novels of 2017 in The Washington Post and Entertainment Weekly. Her latest novel is You Had Me at Ola. Adriana Herrera was born and raised in the Caribbean, but for the last 15 years has let her job and her spouse take her all over the world. She loves writing stories about people who look and sound like her people getting unapologetic happy endings. Her Dreamers series has received starred reviews from Publishers Weekly and Booklist, and has been featured in the Today Show on NBC, Entertainment Weekly, Oprah Magazine, NPR, Library Journal, and The Washington Post. Her latest is Here to Stay. New York Times, Washington Post, and USA Today bestseller Sarah McLean is the author of historical romance novels that have been translated into more than 20 languages. Sarah is a leading advocate for the romance genre, speaking widely on its place at the nexus of gender and cultural studies. A romance columnist and co-host of the weekly romance novel podcast Faded Mates, her work in support of romance and the women who read it earned her a place on Jezebel.com's Shiro's List. Her latest is The Daring and the Duke. Kennedy Ryan, a Rita Award winner and USA Today bestseller, writes for women from all walks of life, empowering them and placing them firmly at the center of each story and in charge of their own destinies. Kennedy and her writings have been featured in Chicken Soup for the Soul, USA Today, Entertainment Weekly, Glamour, and many others. She has always written for charity and nonprofit organizations, but has a special passion for raising autism awareness. The co founder of Lift for Autism, an annual charitable book auction, she has appeared on Headline News, Montel Williams, NPR, and other media outlets as an advocate for ASD families. Her latest is Queen Move. Award-winning author Joanna Shoup has always loved history, ever since she saw her first schoolhouse rock cartoon. Joanna won Romance Writers of America's Golden Heart Award for Best Historical in 2013. Since then, her books have appeared on numerous yearly best-of lists, including Publishers Weekly, The Washington Post, Kirkus Reviews, Kobo, and Bookpage. Her latest is The Rogue of Fifth Avenue. Nikki Woolfolk is a professional chocolatier, published author of short and long fiction, a public speaker, and a fixture within certain fandom and convention-based communities. Their goal is to bridge the gap between joie de vivre of fandom and geeky things and the prestige and know-how of the culinary community. Our moderator, Stephanie Close, is a genre fiction enthusiast, book reviews editor at Library Journal, and Westport resident since 2018. She loves helping readers find the next book they can't put down. Hello, I'm Stephanie Close, and I am thrilled to be here with some terrific romance writers today. Um, I would like to start with a pretty broad question for you all. Why is the romance genre important? Adriana, could you kick us off, please? Wow, um, that's a, I have a lot to say about that, but um, I, it's important because um, it gives the reader a story that ends with a happily ever after and hope. Like we propose the idea that no matter who you are and where you start, at the end, you get a bright future. And as someone that writes Afro-Latinx, queer characters, immigrants, I think it's 
truly like a radical statement in 2020 to say that we get to have that, you know, walk into the sunset with a bright future, despite everything that's going on in the world right now. So I think that's why we're important. Nikki, what do you think? Um, besides saying ditto for Adriana, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> pretty much on point, the aspect of we are writing about hope. We are writing stories that lift us up as we're writing them. Um, especially for me on like on really bad days, I write comedy. So I write a lot of romantic comedy or it just inadvertently is somehow comedic. And I do it, you know, the first draft is always for myself. It is to uplift me in whatever is going on in the outside world. And, you know, the second draft, the edits that I do, uh, it's with the reader in mind, and we're, and I'm basically trying to make sure that that joy, that humor, that level of hope comes through, and a part of them, you know, a part of the reader sees themselves in the different characters, uh, that we're all part of an in-joke, but at the same time, it's like Adriana had said, where it's it's lifting you up, it's giving a different perspective, it's giving you a break for whatever amount of time that you're reading or listening to stories, and especially for us, by us, that is not filled with, you know, after school special tragedy, but instead gives us a happy ending. Uh, Kennedy, how about you? Um, I guess ditto, ditto, uh, <laughs> what's already been said. Uh, but also I think that our genre, more than any other that I can think of, centers women's pleasure. And when done right, our agency. Um, primarily, we are the creators. You know, women are creating the stories. We are telling our stories. And um, for me, kind of one of, personally, one of the things that's central to my mission as a writer is to center marginalized women. And so uh, the value of black and brown joy is very important to me. I write very emotionally wrenching stories. So sometimes, you know, the journey to get there is like, oh, you took me through the ringer. But more than ever, I'm seeing the value of especially marginalized women just having the opportunity to, to express joy, um, to pursue our goals, to see uh, women who are um, focused on and pursuing their own dreams. So I can't think of another genre that um, promotes that the way we do. And I think that the what that signals to women and culture is incredibly important and incredibly empowering. So. Mm -hmm. That's for me. Thanks. And Alexis, I know it's going to get harder as, as we go on, but uh, would you like to add anything? Yeah, um, you know, romance has the happily ever after at the end, but I think it's important because it's not just the romantic happily ever after. We're seeing characters who are overcoming all sorts of hardships, whether they are personal or external, and living a better life by the end, finding more happiness and fulfillment and success, as well as having the romantic love aspect. We're seeing them as whole and complete people. And especially for those of us who are telling stories that are not about characters who are from the dominant culture in media, uh, you know, getting to show our characters also in this way with positive representation and getting to tell our own stories is really important. Mm -hmm. Joanna, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, in addition to what everyone else has said, uh, uh, the search for love and companionship is so elemental and so basic and so hardwired into each and every human on this planet that it almost is, uh, it's almost a no-brainer that these stories are so necessary, are so vital, are so um that need to be so inclusive to represent everybody because it's it's what every movie is about it's what every you know every great piece of literature every you know we're it's what everyone is really in the end searching for in your life and so i think that romance is a great reflection of that drive and that need sarah is there anything you'd like to add about why the romance genre is important um, well, I mean, aside from everything that everyone else has said, I, I do think it's so important to talk about the fact that romance as a genre um, reflects the world that we live in 
over and over, um, whether you're writing historicals or paranormals or contemporaries, there's just a constant sense of romance being a place where um, literature can really iterate on the world. And because we move so quickly as writers, because we're writing in many cases, you know, two books a year, three books a year, more books a year, um, we're able to really have this constant conversation with readers about anxieties and concerns and the way the world is and also hope and uh, partnership and what we want out of the future. And we're able to have this conversation with our readers all the time as romance writers, which is something that I think is really special about the genre and also something that um, other writers don't have the same kind of access to as we do and other readers don't have the same, um, aren't able to see themselves in the same way necessarily in other genres. And so I think that's the real value of romance to the world. Excellent. And since romance is such a huge and varied genre, um, I'd just love to go around and talk a little bit about what subgenres each of you write in. And uh, please feel free to tell us, you know, some details about um, your most recent book or an upcoming book, um, whichever one you like. Um, Kennedy, can we start with you? Sure. Um, I write contemporary romance, and um, like I said before, they tend to be kind of um, emotional, kind of emotional books that are usually grounded in a lot of current events, really tying into a lot of what Sarah was just saying. Um, you know, people always will ask, you know, what inspires you? I'm usually inspired by whatever's going on in the world and a dialogue that I want to have with readers or that I want to spark um, about what's happening in broader culture in the context of a love story. So I saw the Dapple protest and I, I'm like, hey, I think I'm, I'm going to have a meet cute at, the, at a pipeline protest, you know, and I'm, I'm going to write about land grabs and I'm going to write about climate control. And I'm going to write about, you know, so um, it just depends on um, what inspires me most is what's going on in the world. And my stories usually reflect that very current. Um, and so that's, that's me kind of in a nutshell. Great. Alexis, how about you? I'm currently writing contemporary romance. I'm hoping to branch out into some others. Um, and I also will have a couple of cozy mysteries coming up. Um, so I'm writing something different with amateur Latinx sleuths. Uh, my most recent book um, is set on the remake of a telenovela, um, but it's also set in New York City and has Puerto Rican characters and talks about um, issues that are important to them, as well as falling in love. Excellent. Uh, how about you, Joanna? Uh, my books, I write historical romance set in a Gilded Age New York City, which is the time of the Astors and the Vanderbelts and the Robber Barons. Um, my latest book is The Devil of Downtown, which features a, a society do-gooder who um, lives uptown and the criminal kingpin of New York City uh, is the hero of that story. Excellent. Uh, Nikki, how about you? Uh, at this moment, I'm in the middle of writing the sequel to My Maze on Death. It's a historical mystery, and it's uh, two characters uh, of our love interest. One is bisexual, one's a lesbian, and so they basically, uh, they both work at a cooking school, and while, you know, when they're not doing their work, um, they are solving murder mysteries. Um, I put a comical base on it because I wanted to cheer myself up. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm working on right now. Uh, the sequel is called Carrie and Flowers, but instead of F-L-O-W-E-R-S, it's mm -hmm. F-L-O-U-R. Mm -hmm. so, because mystery readers love puns. And okay. so who am I to say that? <laughs> Great, uh, Sarah? I am currently working on a new series. It's called Hell's Bells, uh, and it is set in Victorian era London, uh, and it focuses on a girl gang of kind of Victorian era badass women who are uh, fixers and uh, a little bit a the A-team. Like imagine if the A-team were a girl gang in mm -hmm. Victorian London. Uh, um, and so each story is about one of the leaders of this girl gang, um, and it's really, really fun. It's a great, it's a completely different 
different world for me in the sense that um, I've written a lot of sisters in romances, but I've never written a sisterhood. I've written a lot of brotherhoods. Um, and so I'm really excited about this kind of new world that's really um, managed and controlled and uh, run by women, um, because I feel like that's what we need more of in 2020. So. And Adriana? I, um, I write contempt, well, have been writing contemporary until now. I usually say my tagline is like, I write romance full of people that look and sound like my people. So my books usually have Afro-Latinx characters, there's queer characters. A lot of my books um, until now have been queer romances. Um, I write immigrants because I'm an immigrant and also just in general, like people trying to like thrive in the world. And I'm just venturing into historical romance, which has been interesting already. <laughs> um, and I just announced that I'm writing a series for next year. Um, for 2022 it's coming out and it's three best friends who are Afro-Latinx heiresses from Dominican Republic, Mexico, and Venezuela. And they are met at finishing school and then they're having a girl's trip um, to the 1889 Universal Ex Exposition in Paris. So that has been really fun to research and think about. Um, part of what, just going on what Kennedy said before, I really do try to write from like a mission and like um, my mission is to write stories where Afro-Latinx people are centered and putting them in places where we haven't necessarily been in, in, in fiction in ways in which we are thriving and, and that we are living our best lives instead of um, coming from a narrative that doesn't observe us in other type of ways. Um, well, I would love to know what everybody's favorite tropes are, um, both as a reader and as a writer, if they're different. So Sarah, can you kick us off? Uh, my, I mean, I'm, I'm a romance reader, so I'm hard pressed to find a trope I don't love. Um, but my favorite trope is enemies to lovers. Um, I love the straight shot of conflict between two people who both can't stand each other and cannot not stand each is like and, and have to love each other um and so uh so that's for me what i love what i love to read um i if it if it's sprinkled with these other tropes like there's only one bed and you know he's a secret duke then it's even better for me so <laughs> great what do you think adriana um, I like the, I like rivals to lovers. Like I like, like I'm one of those that loves like a competent um, protagonist, specifically if it's like a, you know, female presenting protagonist, like someone that's like, just the has it together. And so I love to see kind of like the, the, the banter and that type of interaction between two protagonists. Um, I like, I mean, I like the, you know, uh, I was having a panel the other day with a friend Olivia did and she's like, um, let's kiss for science. Like that's other, another trope that I really love, like fake relationship. Um, there's only one bed, of course, that's like a great, like little side dish of something that's always like, it's great, like forced proximity. Um, yeah, I mean, like I'll, I'll read anything really um because i love romance but those are the ones that usually kind of lend themselves to like the stories that i enjoy the most mm -hmm. yeah how about you nikki yep sorry i think you're still muted you're muted there we go how about you nikki <laughs> well when it comes to uh romances that i love i love um mistaken identities um, especially if the person realizes, okay, I, I, I'm misunderstood as somebody else, and then they go with it, and it's completely opposite of their character. I love that. It's partially, you know, what I watch in film, but also I think I secretly like that idea of where we are no longer living up to someone else's expectations, you know, in our regular life, but instead the expectations of this misunderstood character is like something grand and amazing and you know here we've got this docile main character like that's not me and then they realize that's been a part of them all this time 
Um, I love those type of stories. I'm also a sucker for anything with time travel. Um, it doesn't matter who writes it. It always starts as a B minus in my, in my story mind. So I love time travel stories. I love um, also um, uh, fish out of water characters. So like, let's say the, the Southern, you know, the Louisiana Southern person coming up, you know, to New England and, you know, making a life for themselves, which is completely different than what New England is. So, and as a person who moved from California to New England, it's a very interesting space. So I love to do the observations between those two. What do you think, Joanna? I feel like I'm always discovering new ones too. I mean, I, who knew that Sex Planet would be like a, a trope that I was super jazzed about, but here we are in 2020. Um, I love enemies to lovers. That's, I mean, anything like with good banter, like a rivals to lovers or a class conflict or enemies to lover, office, office rivals is like my jam. Um, I love childhood friends to lovers, which Kennedy and Sarah both wrote just amazing versions of that. So, which I totally enjoyed. So that was, um, that's something that I wouldn't have imagined that I loved as much as I do, but I love it. All right, how about you, Kennedy? Um, Joanna took mine. <laughs> I love, okay. I love, I always, I never really know how to talk about it and sound right. Childhood <laughs> lovers, <laughs> childhood romance. Um, I love it when they meet, even if it's not as children, when they meet when they're younger. And I guess it also kind of sprawls into second chance because usually they're separated and they find each other later in life. I really love that kind of setup. Um, I like stories that sprawl. Um, so the one that Joanna was talking about, literally they meet, they're like six months old, <laughs> you know, and it goes till they're like 40. So I love these kind of epic stories that um, take up a whole bunch of space and we get to see a huge arc of those characters as they grow. And I also have found that I love, I love single dad. Um, there was a single dad in the book I just wrote. I'm writing a, uh, working on a series now that's all married couples uh, because I don't know sometimes you don't see married couples as much and the couple that I'm writing now they're actually already divorced so technically it's a single dad <laughs> um, so I, I like stories like that and um, apparently I like barbarians um, because Milovane Milovane um, wrote uh, the, the the barbarian story I can't even think heart of stone cold I can't think of the name of it right now but it is so itty and I love it so much. I'm like on like bated breath for book two as soon as it comes out on audio. So apparently I also like Barbarians. <laughs> and how about you, Alexis? I am also waiting for Millivane's second book to come out in audio. It's next month, I think. Um, <laughs> so good. Uh, I love Force Proximity as like the framework that things are in where they just like can't get away from each other and therefore just have no choice but to fall in love. Um, I am also a fan of second chance romances like Kennedy. Um, something about watching these characters who messed it up before but clearly loved each other because this is their second time at it, um, you know, just overcoming whatever it was that didn't allow them to be together before to figure it out now so that they can actually find lasting happiness. Um, I think it's just really satisfying as a reader. Uh, I also am a sucker for a secret baby. Love those secret babies. And um, one of the tropes that can occur within kind of any of them, but I think is really great in Enemies to Lovers is the nursing back to health trope. I just love it when, you know, one of the characters is like sick for whatever reason or injured or something. And then the other one takes care of them while they're like, you know, no, get away from me, like on their sick bed. Um, and then they wake up and they're like, oh, you mean you've cared for me all this time? Love it. Um, so I'm curious how you all handle conflict. Like do any, do you ever have trouble you know, keeping these people apart when you, everybody knows that they're going to be together and they're meant for each other. Um, Nikki, what do you think? How do you believably build in conflict? Oh, goodness. 
Well, usually mine ends up having a murder that, that, you know, it's like, how do I put this romance in? Well, it's not like, oh, there's a dead body there too. So <laughs> it's a little tricky. <laughs> but um, I found that uh, usually the approach of the two characters, how, you know, one is very bold. Uh, for my chocolatier, she is very bold getting into mischief, um, always asking questions. She's an instructor by trade, so she's always trying to engage others and pleasantly nosy. And her love interest, Josephine, is very reserved, but at the same time has a few tricks up her sleeve, you know, is a, a, you know, a fighter, but yet looks so docile and quiet and elegant. And, you know, just I love the slight opposites where it's not so polar opposite but they're just enough of a different type of uh, approach on how they uh, look at the same things and that being a bit of a conflict as well as I, I think I, I love the challenges between the two characters more than I like the external even though when it comes to different stories that I read I love the two against the world so it's like two people working together against like the enemy or you know they're just like okay that's my enemy. Well, that's my enemy. Okay, now we're best friends and we're fighting against the bad guy. It's like, that's the, the kind of stories that I love. And so I end up inadvertently writing about that. So. Uh, what do you think, Alexis? In terms of conflict, you know, we can have internal and external conflict. Um, and I always, I think, lean more on the internal conflict because once the external is resolved, like you still need a reason you know, for what's going on. Or sometimes, you know, they resolve the internal and then they still have to solve, you know, the murder or whatever um, is happening around them. But for me, a big part of it is finding out what my characters are holding back, like what parts of themselves they're not willing to face, um, you know, what kind of limiting beliefs they, they hold about themselves that they need, they need to like dig out and, and deal with. Um, and the story really is them confronting these things through the action of them falling in love with the other character. So as they're falling in love, all of these parts of themselves are also coming up to be healed. So the conflict comes from them not wanting to do that because that's really uncomfortable. <laughs> so that can really keep it going and kind of build that tension too. Uh, what do you, how about you, Sarah? You're muted. Oh, you're just muted. Yeah, I know. There you go. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> I, my desk is covered in these in post-it notes because I'm a very sort of messy worker. Um, and one of the big ones is one that says this, why can't they be together right now? So this is a question that I ask myself basically every day as I'm writing. Um, and I think that for me, conflict is all about, injecting conflict into a romance novel is all about remembering that there is no such thing as a romance novel that doesn't have a relationship in it between two or three or more people. And so when one person um, actually, the, the conflict of one person's life, the concerns of one person's life, internal or external, have to be impacted by the other people in the romance. Um, and that's a thing that I think it took me a long time as a writer to wrap my head around and sort of understand that the best romances come of one character really wanting something and another character really being blocking that in some way. Um, and so for me, it all comes down to making sure that if there's a plot that I want to, if it's, there's a story I want to tell or a character I want to explore, um, their conflict is a relationship with this other person or these other people. How about you, Joanna? Yeah, I mean, sort of like what Sarah said, I love when I'm crafting characters to think about the exact opposite of that person and that that is, I mean, clearly those two need to be together. So when I had a do-good or heroin, I was like, oh, of course we're going to create a character who's the criminal kingpin and those two somehow are gonna end up together. So I don't know how, and hopefully I'll get there, but um, 
so yeah, for me, um, I like taking the the polar opposites and putting them together. And I, I, I don't know how contemporary writers do it because I feel like I have a little bit of an easier time because I write historical. And so I can use some of those, um, you know, chaperones and conventions and, and sort of the uh, structure uh, that surrounded society a little bit just naturally adds a little conflict. So it's a little, little easier, maybe. Okay. What do you think, Adriana? Sorry. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, I, I like conflict. I think, um, I mean, I guess I think a lot about like, like, power dynamics and I, I write I brought I write black women and sometimes I write interracial romance which means that it's a, a white um, you know love interest it could be same sex person or it could be um, not but I, I really tried to kind of like think about the ways that like society is already putting them at odds you know um, I have like the book um, that I have coming out next week here to stay, um, the heroine is Julia Del Mar Ortiz. She is a, she's a director for a nonprofit um, for a department store in Dallas. And she runs a program basically helping immigrant children and refugee um, children in Texas in an after school program. And the hero, Rocco, who is a New Yorker, they're, they're all New Yorkers in, in, in Dallas. Um, but Rocco is a consultant that's been brought to the company to take it to like to make it go public. And so part of his job is to cut some of the programs and some of the board wants the foundation to kind of like be downsized. And so there's like a huge conflict there because, um, you know, and there's other stuff like Julia moved to Dallas with her boyfriend and he dumped her after two weeks. So she doesn't want to go home unemployed and dumped. And he's got his sister that he needs to support. So they've got their own personal internal conflicts of why these, their positions, their jobs are so important to them. And then I have a, a white man in a position that he can take this woman who is a black woman's job, right? And then there's like literal like children who are refugees who need this program. So like navigating that, I mean, the stakes are way high, but I also like a lot of it was like them thinking about their own positions in the world and like the things that impact them as they navigate, navigate in the world because Rocco's a good guy. Like he's very morally conflicted about what, he's, what he needs to do, but still like, you know, he has to think about his position or her position. So all of that to say, um, I think when you write people of color, like society already, like the way that society works and systems of oppression already work and like what we navigate are already such a source of conflict and stakes for us that it's just kind of like the fun part of getting to like have our people get their happy ending and thrive. Um, that was a really long answer, sorry. That's great. How about you, Kennedy? Um, I think I probably approach it a lot like what Adriana was just describing in the sense that there's a definite partnership between internal and external conflict. And I'm always um, uh, escalating conflict. You know, like it starts in the beginning of the book, you, you think these are the conflicts and then I'm gonna raise the stakes and it evolves into this other conflict. Like in the beginning, for example, um, you know, uh, the heroine, she's Yavapay, um, she's, um, Yavape Apache, and she, you know, is protesting a pipeline that's being laid on sacred ground. And the hero, it's his his family's company that's laying the pipeline. So you think, oh, that's the conflict. And it is, um, but then it becomes another conflict, you know, and then it becomes as they they're older, because the book starts when she's like 13. And like I said, it ends when they're like 40, you know, so over the course of that life, the conflicts are going to change, the stakes are going to change, what's important to them is going to to change. So by the end of the book, it's that she has started her own political consulting firm to empower marginalized, you know, candidates who are going to champion marginalized groups. And she has this all this agency and all this power. And now he is going to be the president of the United States. And she's like, first lady, 
you know, I mean, it's like, do you know what I mean? It's like, it's this, she's like, okay. And everybody, so funny, because all the romance readers are like, well, of course she wants to be the first lady, you know? But I'm like, well, yeah, but, uh, you know, in this construct, in this society, currently, when you become the first lady, there's a lot that you potentially, you know, give up, uh, you know, potentially. And so anyway, uh, the conflict kind of, I'm always looking for how can I raise the stakes and how can I escalate the conflict? Um, not in a way that feels like, whoa, it's a, a soap opera, but just that as these people change, their, you know, things that are important to them are also changing and the world around them and what is demanding of them um, and requiring them is also changing. Uh, now, a couple of you have already mentioned audiobooks, so I just want to throw that out there. Like, do you all listen to audiobooks? And if um, if there are audio editions of your own books, are you involved in all in choosing the narrators? And Alexis, I'm going to start with you because I'm actually listening to yours right now, and it is so good. So I love audiobooks. Um, Kennedy, I'm also waiting for Queen Move to be out in audiobook, which I think is also coming up soon. Um, I just with everything in the world right now, I'm having a really hard time just sitting down to read. So audiobooks have kind of been um, like a bomb for me. Like I'll sit down with an audiobook and a puzzle and just it like completely engages my mind in a way that I cannot feel stress about other things aside from like, why can't I find the next piece for this puzzle? Um, or, you know, whatever's going on in the story. Um, so audiobooks uh, through the New York Public Library's Overdrive app have really been getting me through right now. I've listened to probably over 40 this year, um, including by many of the people on this panel. Mm -hmm. um, and regarding my audiobook, For You Had Me at Ola, um, they did actually send me um, like a bunch of auditions for narrators, something like seven of them. Um, so I got to listen to all of these uh, voice actors read a little piece of my book. They all read the same piece. And I picked uh, the one who I thought would match the project best. And then it turned out that under the name that is on the audiobook, uh, she's actually my favorite audiobook narrator. <laughs> <laughs> so that was lucky. Um, so I was uh, really happy with how that turned out. That's great. And Kennedy, I know you mentioned listening Oh yeah, that's really, I, maybe it's just the pandemic, um, but it's it's really the main way I read. I don't know what it is about only processing things through my ears right now, um, but also I found as things got really busy that I wasn't reading as much. Um, and I'm, you know, typically a voracious reader and just because of schedule and life, I realized that I wasn't reading. And so I had this commute, you know, in the olden days when we went places, um, I had like two hours a day in the car, uh, taking my son back and forth to school. And that's how I started listening to audiobooks. I just listened to one of yours, Joanna. Um, uh, last week, I just found uh, Mia, Mia Vancey. I think I'm saying that right, but, uh, and uh, I that's what I listen to pretty much all the time. As far as my own audio, I am notoriously a control freak, notoriously. Um, so most, I'm a hybrid author, I have some traditional, but um, most of my books are self-published and I've just started doing, producing my own audio books and it's fantastic for a control freak like me, <laughs> you know, because I'm like, I'm choosing my narrator, I'm auditioning you. I, you know, all the little things like, there's so many details in it as an, now that I'm an audiophile, that I think of, I approach it in a different way. And for me, that process of actually producing my books, of course, that means I keep keep a lot of my money, you know, when I produce the books, but it also means that I get to control the artwork and all of that's really important to me. And audio is the fastest growing market, you know, right now. So um, it's just something that I'm really investing in uh, as a businesswoman um, and then also, you know, as a reader. Mm -hmm. Uh, how about you, Adriana? Um, yes, I listen to a lot of audio. Um, I'm, I'm also a big reader and I used to have a commute. I, I work in New York City, so I used to have to go into New York City. Now I don't have a commute. But it has helped to have audio because that's, I think, what I... Um, I used to not listen to romance and audio. I had it very much separated. Like, I would only listen to nonfiction or, like, um, history books on 
audio and then only romance on my Kindle or print books. But now I listen to everything on audio. So I'm a big audiobook fan. And most, like, I, all of my books are on audio. Um, my Dreamer series, which was my debut series, we all, we had the same narrator for all the books. It was Sean Kristen, who's amazing. And they were, they did give me some choices for who, um, who I wanted. And um, for Here to Stay, it's Sean Kristen as the um, hero's voice. And then I, I was able to get um, a Dominican um, female narrator for the heroine, which was great. And Finding Joy, which came out earlier this year, it's a book set in Ethiopia, it's a queer romance. And that audio is coming out um, in September and that they were also like really great. And I was able to pick um, the narrator. And I was like really picky about that one because one of the heroes is Ethiopian. And so I was really worried that they weren't gonna get the accent right. So I was happy that I was able to get who I thought was the best narrator. How about you, Nikki? Do you like audiobooks? I eat them up as quickly as I can. Um, when my hearing is doing pretty good, um, I'm starting to lose my hearing, which most people don't know. Uh, but when things are really good, uh, audiobooks are my jam. And I think that it's partly, now when I think back on it, it's partly um, due to generational as well as cultural, like as far as oral storytelling. So whenever I'm doing events, you know, back in the day when we used to go out, um, outside of our homes to do events. Um, if you ask me a question, I'll answer it, but I'm not going to give you a yes or a no. I'm going to give you this long ass story, but at the same time, we're going to have a little humor. We're going to have a little cliffhanger. We're going to have, and it's, I realize that that's not, <laughs> that's not a common thing, at least not in New England, but that's <laughs> like a fish out of water kind of fun thing. Cause I grew up with a, a Southern uh, father and a mom from the North. So storytelling was always a thing. So I love listening to audio because it reminds me of that. It, 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 it's a comfort. And uh, I love hearing the narrator do the different voices. Uh, one of the things that I've listened to audiobooks a lot, but one of the ones that I love doing is um, my family and I would take long trips and I would get to pick out the book for everybody. So one of the years I picked out Neil Gaiman's Anansi Boys and I'd never, seen or read something from a white novelist that writes black characters in the manner of respect and joy and you know storytelling and so you know my son is biracial my husband is white and to hear about you know these main characters that were people of color and you know really going into this narrative was something amazing and it changed my partner's mind because at first he was just like I don't do audiobooks they're really bad and I'm like they're not you know when you find the right narrator it's magical. And that's one of the things where I keep thinking to myself, I should probably do the same. I would love to have my stories in audio. Um, especially there's one scene in one of my mysteries. It uh, takes place at a bordello where that's men servicing women and men and everyone else. And there's a ring toss scene. And just for that alone, I really want a narrator to read that because having the editor read that through to the point where her notes, she said she was crying and laughing so hard from it. I would love to find out what a narrator, like how they go about, you know, keeping it together with such a absurd scene. So I love audiobooks. I would love to um, have my work out there in audio. And that's something that I've been actually working on right now, uh, doing the shorts, uh, the short stories and going from there. So hopefully I will have wonderful, uh, Fortune, just like everyone else, where they've had the narrators of their dreams. So we'll see. How about you, Sarah? Uh, narrators are mean are everything in audio. I think it it almost feels like the book isn't yours anymore when it's in the hands of you know an amazing narrator. Um, I am really lucky that I um, have been able to work with the same narrator for the last seven books. Um, so she knows me and I know her. And um, I think sometimes about how it'll sound when she reads it. Um, and I never worry. I know a lot of, I hear Kennedy <laughs> and I know a lot of uh, writers worry about what you know, what the book is actually going to sound like. And um, and so my my narrator is Justine Eyre, 
Um, we actually moved from, an, I had another narrator when I was writing straight regencies with a lot of ballrooms that was a sort of much more um, kind of Austin, Austin type of narrator. And then as my books got darker and started moving away from ballrooms, uh, we decided that we needed a different kind of narrator, somebody who could really like deliver on the grit. And, um, and so we picked Justine and she's really fabulous. And she's actually Joanna's narrator too for the last series, so. Great. Yeah, Joanna, what's your experience with audiobooks? Yeah, I feel like the odd person out because <laughs> I don't, um, I don't listen to audiobooks. I feel like um, I, need like that quiet time where I don't have like headphones in or I'm not, and I'm, you know, I don't have a commute. Um, I don't think I, I process um, stories easily um, when they're told to me. Maybe I have a short attention span. Maybe it's like, I don't know, um, my brain deteriorating. I don't know, but I just can't, I follow much easier when I read it and um, when I can see it. And, but, you know, I love um, choosing the narrator, you know, landing Justine Eyre was, was um, I was very fortunate to get her. And um, I was really glad that, that she could read this last Uptown Girls series and um, choosing the narrators is always fun. And, and I love the whole process of being involved with it, but, um, but may, I'm inspired. I'm going to go download some audiobooks and I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Um. You know, one thing that's come up a lot as we're talking about audiobooks is the pandemic and not being able to move around. And and I'm really interested in what you all think, what kind of changes we're going to see in the genre because of the pandemic. Uh, Sarah, do you want to kick us off? I, uh, hmm. that is a good question. I certainly think that we're going to start seeing I think originally we had all sort of talked and it, it, I, I, anytime I had a conversation with other writers, we had sort of all thought, well, it could go either way. Like either COVID will be a part of, of romance or it won't, you know, depending upon, you know, how authors feel and, um, and also, but I think that was in the early days when it didn't feel like it was happening for so long. Like we have a generation, of, we are, we are a generation of people who are um, who are really impacted by this and because of everything that I said at the beginning of our panel I think that romance is going to have to, to is going to have this as a part of its DNA certainly I think contemporary romances are going we're going to see COVID as a piece of the puzzle or at least the scars of COVID as a piece of the puzzle in contemporary um, I think uh, you know, for for those of us who don't write contemporaries, there are going to be other things that sort of become more um, present. And I think we we might well start seeing like more doctors, more health, more you know, more a a, re, a new analysis of what a hero looks like in historicals. Um, and I would love to say I would love to see some more. I would like to see this become a a, a kind of rising tide of paranormal, um, because I think. Paranormal gives us back a little bit of that fantasy of like the the fear of sickness is a different kind of fear when your characters are immortal. Um, and I I don't know those are my sort of three big ideas about where we're going with this. What do you think, Adriana? Um. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I think Sarah, well, I think we're in a panel with you early, early in, when we were like young and supple in, in the <laughs> pandemic. And now <laughs> I, we, I, there was an urgency there that I felt it was going to change everything. And now like most terrible things, I think, in, in, that happen in our world, I think there's been a normalization of this of the way that we live now under this pandemic and I think it doesn't feel as um as a like complete 180 in our lives like now this is our life and so I think because as Sarah was saying before romance moves so fast 
I think we've gone through like eight of the stages already. And I think like, because again, also like publishing timelines, like what we're thinking we're going to write now, it's not going to come out. Like if your indie comes out sooner, but if you're traditional publishing, it's like a year, be, like a year once you start writing, it's like a year and a half before it comes out. So I think like if you're thinking, I mean, market wise, I think it's going to, I honestly think it's going to have less of an impact than I thought it was going to have because I'm already as a writer feeling less of a pressure to really like dive into like now everything I read is gonna be about the pandemic like it's like I may have an opportunity to look into it because I write contemporary romance I read I write about New York City New York City was impacted so um in a big way so I, I probably will touch upon it but I don't think it's feeling as urgent as it was back in you know April or when I felt like wow this might really change like the course of the next three years of romance but I do think um, a trend that seems to be kind of coming up is like the the paranormal and that that trend um, Sarah and I have talked about this was one trend that started after September 11 there was a there was a surge to paranormal and it will be interesting to see what that happens medical romance perhaps but yeah i feel really differently about it in terms of like the impact that it's having on me personally as an author um, as opposed to in the beginning what do you think nikki um it took me a while to kind of sit with that uh information i noticed for me besides uh, being an author, I'm also a chocolatier. So I have my own like little chocolate company where I sell online. That has changed how I see people interacting. There is more of a, I mean, I had my, my regulars and my followers and now word of mouth is becoming even more of a thing like this small little, little shop. Um, because I'm a person of color, now suddenly I'm the belle of the ball and it's a little odd. Um, it's a little different. But I've noticed that it has changed how my company is viewed as, you know, more of small, yes, but also engaging with each and every person as the individual they are, as well as being a part of life, you know, milestones and joys, as well as what my stories end up becoming and what I'm, I'm finding in stories that are becoming more popular I've noticed that there's more of an engagement with storytelling, especially the people that are able to put out the books so fast. Um, in romances, uh, there's a friend of mine who just wrote a pandemic based. So it was a cute meet where they're kind of stuck, like very close proximity. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised because I'm like, how do you write this? This is a, you know, this is a really scary time, but uh, she's a very skilled writer. So she was able to pull it off. But I've noticed that in, in trends and whatnot, like recently, like reverse harems, academy stories, paranormal stories. So I'm wondering if um, the pandemic will be used as a metaphor, like heavier metaphored uh, stories, you know, coming into the future. So for myself, um, I probably won't be writing directly about the pandemic, but I will probably use it as a metaphor. Um, usually my villains and, you know, the, the, the tragedies that happen in my stories, they're always a metaphor, a uh, metaphor for you know, what happens when we don't take care of our mental health um, and we're more susceptible to issues. So I'll use certain things as a metaphor. So I'm, I'm thinking that that will probably happen to a lot of us that don't write directly about what's happening in the world, but we still want to acknowledge that this, is, this has affected us. So, you know, I guess my long answer to a very, you know, should have been short uh, answer was, um, more of this will probably play as a metaphor in storylines. So I think, you know, Sarah's right as far as, you know, the paranormal um, and also, you know, more doctors and nurses and stories as the heroes. So switching is of what we think a hero is uh, in our fictional world and then seeing it in real time. Joanna, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's almost impossible to really foresee, I think it's going to change so much about what we're seeing, what we will see in romance in the next couple of years. I mean, um, you know, just who's left in the workforce, you know, who's losing their jobs at a faster rate than, you know, that's going to impact how people are traveling is different. People are, um, 
not traveling to New Orleans and Miami and New York City. They're, they're renting small cabins out in the wilderness. I mean, um, I just feel like um, people are moving out of big cities into smaller cities. So I feel like that we're, there's no way really it's going to impact so much about our society and our, um, the way we live, the way we interact, the way we, um, the way we, you know, talk to each other. So I, I, I'm interested to see what's going to happen. I don't, I don't have any, any idea really. Alexis, what do you think? Um, I mean, I was convinced in March that the publishing industry was just going to fall. Like this was just the end and, you know, there was no point in even writing my next book because it was all over. Um, and obviously we've moved on from there, but the, um, you know, I think uh, in terms of what the others are saying, with the books that I planned before this happened, I can't change them right now, but I think what we're going, what I'm doing, and I think what other people might be doing as well is kind of processing these emotions through the books. So w the one I'm working on right now is two people staying in a house together. And at first I was like, oh, it's going to be like so sexy. And now I'm like, no, they're just like really like sick of each other and like frustrated with each other and in each other's faces. <laughs> Um, because that's the reality for me right now. Um, you know, but I do think we're also going to see a resurgence of um, paranormal the same way we did after 9-11, but I think it's going to be a different kind of paranormal because what we saw then was kind of this like darker, angstier, like very like, you know, vampires and werewolf packs and alpha males and like things like that. And I think what we'll see now is combined with what we've seen since the election where people have wanted these kind of like more upbeat light rom-com kind of stuff is that we'll see some of those lighter paranormals or paranormals that are um more like rom-com in tone and style um you know and like nikki was saying about the metaphor i think we will see people processing their emotions about what's happening now through the kinds of stories they're writing but also i think we might see characters who are more engaged than we have seen in the past, like um, whether that's, you know, politically engaged or whatever the metaphor is within the story, people who are more actively involved in what's going on in the world around them, I hope. And Kennedy, would you like to add anything? Um, I don't know that I have much more to add. It's all speculation for me. I don't have like a crystal ball at all. Um, for me, I'm not really, I don't, I don't have an interest to write about, you know, the pandemic. Um, I, I was listening to an interview with Issa Rae, who does, um, she's a writer, creator, director, <laughs> uh, uh, stars in Insecure and HBO. And uh, she was talking about how they're handling the pandemic. And she was saying there weren't going to be, things are moving so fast. Um, I think somebody else was saying this, you know, we'll be in phase two one day and then we're back to, you know, things are moving really, really fast. Um, in one state, you know, they're on, you know, they're on lockdown today and then the next day they're out with masks. It, it's moving so fast that I don't necessarily want to craft things that, um, that have so much of it in that, but I am very interested in like the book that I'm writing now uh, deals with grief. There's a lot of joy, <laughs> um, but it also deals with grief. And I think that the way I'm approaching this book, there's just a, there's, it may be shaping the way I'm approaching writing it because I feel like we are a nation that's right now. Um, that there's like this mass scale of grief because we've lost so many and there's so many people who have lost um, family members and loved ones over the course of um, this so far. Um, I, you know, so just taking care of readers, you know, who would be reading about grief and thinking about it and being very careful and thoughtful about um, those things. And um, yeah, that's it. I don't have any more to say than what everybody else has already said. Uh, well, I'm curious what you all wish people knew about writing as a career, either about romance specifically or just in general. Joanna, let's start with you. Uh, what people, what I wish people knew about writing as a career, mm -hmm. it is not easy and it does not get easier. <laughs> I mean, I think, 
Um, I, yeah, I mean, just that's the first answer that really comes to my mind. So I'll, I'll stick with it, which is this, you know, I, I think I thought that the more books um, you have out there, the easier it gets, you know, you sort of know, and, and you do, I mean, you know, you know, um, the production process, you know, the beats of a story that you need to hit, but there's so much external stuff that really, once you become published, that external stuff uh, takes a lot of your time away from writing and it just doesn't get easier. How about you, Adriana? I mean, I think, um, well, it doesn't get, it's not easy and it doesn't get easier. I also think that um, it's very different than the expectations. I think there's a lot more, like it all feels like so, you know, like, you know, like in the world, in, in the world, in the way we live, live now, where so much of our lives are kind of, kind of like rendered through like social media and like tidbits. And um, I think it's, it, the the drudgery of it all is not something that you can really see and I think that's the piece of it that um, that's different like there's a lot of waiting there's a lot of things like I'm hybrid so is Kennedy and part of the reason why I'm hybrid is because some of the stories I write traditional publishing just isn't ready for at any given moment so I ha like I, I made the decision to just self-publish some of the stuff that I want to write and that you know, publishing is not particularly ready for. Um, and so like, that's, I think for, for me as a woman of color, um, who's writing queer characters, I think there's a, there has been a lot of disappointment. There's been a lot of really awesome moments. And I think like, there's a lot more work involved. Like it's a real hustle. I think people, um, like this is a job, like it's your business person, as um, Kennedy said, you have to think as a business person. And so, it's, it's a lot, it's, you know, when we used to be able to go places, conventions and photos and like hung out, hang out with our friends and it's wonderful. And then there's also like the business to it, which um, is, is real. My, like, I always tell my daughter, I have two jobs. One is writing the book and the other one is selling the book. And so like, I have to do both. Um, and I think that's something that doesn't kind of like come through a lot. How about you, Alexis? Uh, when you asked the question, my first thought was that it's not easy, like Joanna said. That's, I think, number one. Um, I think there's also this misconception for some reason that writers just like have a lot of free time because it seems like we're just sitting at our computers, right? And we're just home, so we must have all of this time. And, you know, in the before times when people could just like be like, hey, you want to come hang out? Um, I would get a lot of friends who were like, hey, I'm in the neighborhood, like, you want to go get lunch or something? And I was like, I realized that I'm not like at an office or like with a client right now, but like I'm working I, and I, I need this space to work. I think writing in terms of actually crafting the book requires so much time and space that we really need to ourselves. Um, and that sometimes can be really difficult to carve out in the midst of everything else going on in the life of a human being, but also in the business of being an author. Like, you know, I sit down with the best of intentions at the start of the day, like I'm gonna like just spend these next bunch of hours on my book and then all these emails start coming in and then all I've done all day is answer emails about my book and haven't gotten any words done. Um, so it can be really hard to protect your time in that way. And I think the other thing people don't know, um, which is really hard, especially if you are a control freak, like Kennedy mentioned earlier, and like I am, um, is that, you know, if you are traditionally published, especially, there's like 20 other people who are weighing in on every decision about your book, and you don't even know who they are. <laughs> you know, you have your communications with your editor and maybe with your, you know, publicist and whoever else, um, you know, but there's, you got to pick your battles too. That's all I'll say. Love them all. How about you, Kennedy? Um, uh, uh, I think it's kind of a combination of what a lot of people have said. Obviously, it's hard. Um, the thing that really is resonant for me, too, is that it's time 
consuming for me I'm classic workaholic and uh you would think now you get to do I remember when I had I was working a full-time job I was also running a found an autism foundation uh, a, a foundation serving families with children who have autism and then I was also writing um traditionally so I had you know I was on someone else's deadline. So I had all three of those things going on and I was terribly productive. <laughs> and then when I, um, I don't, I no longer run my foundation. I have other outlets for um, autism philanthropy and I don't have another, you know, actual job. So all I have is writing and I'm like, why am I less productive? <laughs> also, why am, it's consuming. You know, I find myself, my husband's like, it's you're the boss you know you're the boss but i it's so hard for me to shut it off you know like you're i'm get i'm fi it's like i'm finally getting to do the thing that i'm most passionate about the thing that i feel i talk a lot about mission and writing and purpose because for me i feel like i was put on this earth to be a storyteller um, and to impact culture through my stories. So it, it's very, I'm very passionate about it. It's very personal for me and it's hard to shut off. And it's often hard to protect my relationships, my marriage, you know, all the, all the real life stuff. Um, I get so tunnel vision and a lot of my friends who are authors also get very, very tunnel vision um, in the business of writing and in the creation of it that everything else just kind of fades. Um, so it's all of those things and uh, look, putting in place the, how important it is to put in place the disciplines and the habits to protect the rest of your life and those relationships um, to make it can be very lonely. Um, it's a very, I mean, as many friends as you have, it comes down at some point where it's you and the story. And if you're as cons you get as consumed with it as I find myself, it's a lot of times just me and this story. And I realize, gosh, I haven't called my mom in two weeks or I haven't, you know, I haven't done this, I haven't done that. So um, yeah, just putting those disciplines in place to protect my life from this thing that can become very easily for me an obsession and making sure that I have other people in my life to hold me accountable and that I have good friends. You know, I have other authors who understand and I can talk to and I can work with who are also, you know, they have my back, I have their back and that I have a tribe. Very important. How about you, Nikki? This is a good question. Um, so these are self-care answers, so there's two. So the first one is you don't have to write every scene in order. Um, there are times, and I say this because I had to finally tell myself after 20 something years, like if I'm feeling really, really angry or blue or whatever the case may be, uh, that is the perfect time for me to write down a scene that needs to be that heavy. Because by the time I'm done with it, it's off of my shoulders, it's out there and I've put in a perspective, an emotion there that I wouldn't have been able to pull from if I wasn't already in that space. So it's a twofold thing and it's very helpful. So it's like I get it out and then later on I can edit it later. But also too, um, I get a scene written. So <laughs> it's like, ooh, bonus. Um, the second thing uh, as far as I just discovered this and I feel so embarrassed. Um, I've been doing more um, work with my chocolate company because it's tied to the books that I write. I usually write food centric books and then, you know, there's chocolate mention. So one of the things that I just recently learned is there is a difference between a to-do list and projects. I was putting them all together and then couldn't figure out why my to-do list was long as hell. So now it's like, oh, okay, whether it's storyline or I have like a scene to write or the chapter, it's like, okay, is this a project? Or is this a to-do list? Is this piece that I have to write this scene in, is it part of that or is it part of a bigger picture? So really looking at that perspective so that my list of things to do isn't so overwhelmingly long. So for me, it, it's, it's been more of writing is hard. I definitely agree. Thank you, Joanna. <laughs> um, but trying to figure out how do I navigate because, you know, it, it was interesting what Kennedy had said because, um, I have a kid that's on the spectrum. He's autistic. And so I'm navigating the world through his eyes as well as what we do and how we engage and how we engage with the world. 
as well as being a partner um, and working through during this pandemic and you know having all these things happening and changing careers and all this stuff and realizing okay so the world is always going to be on fire things are always going to fall apart there's always going to be joys if i look for them but really getting more honed on what is self-care and it's not always going to be the bubble bath or you know whatnot but it's sometimes the strict rule of adhering to a to-do to -do list and not adding more to it and adding more stress because being a writer is stressful as it is. What do you think, Sarah? Uh, I think that it is really hard for people who um, don't make a living being artists or craftsmen or craftspeople to understand that um, art is work, that art takes time and energy and thought and craft and revision. Um, and I think that often people who don't know what it's like to sit down and create a thing um, feel like there's this mythology about artists in the world that we just sit down and paint a portrait or sit down and write a book or sit down and you know craft a piece of music. and um, you know, Kennedy knows this, that I spend a lot of time thinking about the difference between, you know, who am I as an artist, who am I as a craftsman, or, or as a craftsperson, and um, I never, I very rarely think of myself as an artist, and I think part of the reason why is because I fall into this hole of like, well, if I'm an artist, then it should be easier in some way. Um, but the work of writing is about revision and it's about, you know, plotting and, you know, commas, you know, like copy edits and like the level of sort of minutia that you spend, the, the amount of time you spend on that is just as valuable. Ultimately, when the product is, is in the hands of, of readers, what they're getting is the result of so much more than that, you know, one day, eight months ago, when I wrote one good sentence without thinking about it, you know? <laughs> and I think that's really hard. It's hard. It's particularly hard for women, too. I think this is a very, like, gendered, in some ways, conversation, because I think, um, we, you know, just listening to all of us here talk about, like, the worry that comes with, is my time valuable enough? to give to this project versus kids, job, day job, partner, life. Um, so I think that one thing that I, I wish people knew about writers is that we are small business people who are working very hard to produce a product for you to enjoy. And so, um, and there's no, there really isn't as much magic to it as it seems. Like there's of course talent and love and, there are definitely moments that feel magical, but um, a lot of it is about uh, how we how we look at the world, how we move through the world, and how we view the world, and how we can translate that for you and for joy, for your joy. And that's particularly for romance too, how we can show you the best possible life that we can show you um, for our characters. Um, and that is as much work as it is art much craft as it is art. Um, well, we only have a few minutes left, um, but before we wrap up, I'd just like to give everyone an opportunity to recommend either an author or a specific book that you think is underappreciated and could use a little more attention. Um, so Sarah, let's start back with you. Um, I'm just going to talk about a book that's coming uh, at the end of the month that I'm in love with. Is that okay? <laughs> yes. um, Tracy Livesey, Like Lovers Do, is out at the end of the month, and I am wild about Tracy's writing. Um, she Nobody writes a badass heroine who is just great at her, her deeply competent, to use Adriana's earlier word, um, and also just like knows herself, knows what she wants, knows like the way, the, the where she stands in the world. Um, and that is true of all of Tracy's books, bar none. But this one is about a sort of very brilliant surgeon um, who, uh, who, who uh, at work, 
reprimands the wrong intern who happens to be a very rich young man who uh, then immediately runs to daddy and, and complains about her. And um, she ends up, her job is, is, is threatened and she ends up uh, with her best friend who happens to be the black sheep son of a medical empire romance style. Um, and uh, they make a deal. Like he needs a fake girlfriend for a week on Martha's Vineyard. Fake girlfriend is another one of my favorite tropes. And she needs, and if she plays the part of his fake girlfriend for one week on Martha's Vineyard with his very rich family, he will talk to his dad and try and get things smoothed over at the hospital where she works. And it is a delicious friends to lovers story. There's some hot hammock sex in there. Um, and I mean, it's also like everyone in Tracy's books is on fire and this is no different. Um, and it's just a really magnificent story about a woman um, a heroine who just knows, who, who knows who she is um, and knows what she wants and isn't afraid to get it. And I think she, it's just so delicious. You should all read it. Great. How about you, Nikki? Uh, two authors. So I am in awe and in love with Zigzag Claiborne. He's a friend of mine, Clarice Young, um, Clarence Young. He writes humorous, uh, speculative fiction, and he is just, he's a joy. I mean, even, you know, in his books is written with such humor, tongue in cheek. Everybody's, you know, you as a reader are in on the joke, and it's so over the top and it makes you chuckle. And if you ever get a chance to meet uh, Mr. Young, he is, oh, he's a blessing. Um, he is everything amazing and um He's just got a voice. He is, uh, you know, literally and figuratively, um, he is an amazing writer. Uh, another person is Nicole Smith. She is uh, the proprietor of Mocha Stories. Um, and she writes, you know, everything between speculative fiction, speculative fiction with mystery elements, detective, you know, a sci-fi detective as well. And I love, I love her to pieces. So Nicole Smith. Clarence Young writing as Zigzag Claiborne, and yeah, so those are those are some that I'm I'm gobbling up right now. Thank you. How about you, Kennedy? Um, the one that's freshest in my mind, um, I'm almost done, uh, is Nisha Sharma's uh, The Legal Affair, uh, which just came out this week. And it's so good. It's so, it's sexy. It's very smart. Um, it, to borrow again, uh, Adrian, Adriana's phrase, deeply competent uh, heroine who is badass. And she deals with uh, like cybersecurity. And the thing I love about it is um, there's so much South Asian culture that's just effortlessly woven into the story and um i'm learning so much about the culture but at the same time i'm really thinking about the fact that i'm learning so much about the culture and uh i love the chemistry between the characters and um it's a heroine who immigrated from her country and uh, the, the hero is from a very prominent family from that country. And it's a very patriarchal culture. And she has these preconceived notions about, uh, you know, the whole world is a patriarchal culture, it feels like. But she has all these preconceived notions about how they will interact and how he will treat her because he comes from the same patriarchal culture. And he basically just starts to break that down, you know, and he, he approaches her from a place of equity. Um, and the power dynamics in their relationship and the way she, um, she owns her sexuality. She's an incredibly sexual woman. Um, and I just, I heard Nisha and Sierra Simone talking last night about how so many times we as women of color are not allowed to be full, our full sexual selves. Um, we've been so fetishized in, in a lot of ways and just how we have been treated in broader culture and how our sexuality has been um, diminished in some ways, exploited in some ways, the dignity of it has been stripped in so many ways. And I just loved how this character, this heroine Raj, completely owned her sexuality. There was no shame in it. Um, and at the same time, just completely embraced her, her culture. It was, it's a beautiful story. I'm almost done. So I, um, I've been telling everybody about it and I, I highly recommend it. The Legal Affair. How about you, Alexis? 
Um, I would recommend uh, Ruby Lang, who has a series of books called The Uptown Collection. I believe the first one is Playing House. Um, and her books are just so smart and funny. Um, and they really capture the feeling of being in um, this area of New York City. Uh, the first book is about a couple of, um, I think they're urban planners. And they do something which I feel like is a very New York thing. Um, I certainly have done it <laughs> where, well, I haven't done the fake relationship part. It's the two characters who pretend to be together when they go to open houses of apartments um, because they just want to see what the inside of these apartments in New York City look like, which is a real thing of mine. Like, I'll, you know, I'll be walking on the street sometimes and I'm like looking in, like if the windows are open, I'm like, what does that apartment look like? You know, um, just out of curiosity, because there's so many different types of buildings and, and um, lifestyles and, you know, socioeconomic <laughs> levels here uh, in the city. And, um, you know, it just becomes also this like very sweet and emotional and sexy romance between the characters. Um, so I would say Ruby Lang. Um, and I'll also give a shout out, uh, since Joanna mentioned the sex planet uh, already, uh, my critique partner, Robin Lovett, has this uh, erotic sci-fi series that if you just want like really wild, like aliens, enemies to lovers, um, camping on a sex planet, <laughs> like, check it out. Who could resist that? <laughs> uh, how about you, Adriana? Um, everybody saw my answers, but it's okay, because I had more. Um, so I had Ruby, I had Nisha. <laughs> um, so I actually have two. Um, I have um, Olivia Dade um, as a friend, but also she is an amazing author. She writes fat heroines who are amazing and living their best lives. Her most recent was 40 Love, which is about Tess, who goes on vacation for her 40th birthday for her best friend. And her top comes off as she's swimming in the morning and a very hot younger ex-tennis pro rescues her. Um, and it's just a delight. I mean, Olivia's one of my favorite authors, but she is also doing so much work around representation in terms of like women who are the women that we all are in the real world and just like boldly and like unapologetically like having them on the page living and being adored for who they are. So I would, and it's super funny, like that opening scene is worth the entire book. So 40 Love is one. And I have another one, it's um, Sharish Reed. Um, she is, she has Hearts on Hold, which is, um, a book about a, um, black academic. She's a professor in a small, like, elite liberal arts college, and she's trying to get a project with the public library, and, of course, there's a like, super hot librarian, there's kitchen sex, it's amazing, but I think all, it's also, she really kind of explores the challenges of being a, a black woman in academia and does it in a way that's um, smart and compelling. And she herself, I think, is also in academia. So it's really, it's very authentic and really resonates. So those are my two. And how about you, Joanna? So I have two as well. Um, the first one is Boyfriend Material by Alexis Hall, which I utterly adored. Um, I laughed, I cried. I mean, it was hilarious. Um, it's a son of an aging rock star who he's estranged with. And the son is in the tabloids all the time, kind of falling down and they've spinned him into this, you know, um, alcoholic, drunk, buffoon, sort of like his father. And it's a fake relationship, which I, you know, which we love as a trope. And so that book was really, really fun. Um, the other book is a Regency historical that comes out at the end of September, which is um, Diana Quincy's Her Night with the Duke. Um, the heroine is half English, half Arab, and she ends up in a, she's a travel writer and she's back in England for a small stretch and she ends up in a tavern one night and she has this very hot one night stand with this man that she's never met before. They go their separate ways, and she ends up at her, uh, it ends up that her 
stepdaughter is now engaged to the man that she has the one night affair with. So there you go. <laughs> spoiler. It's not really a spoiler alert. But um, so that's sort of how the book opens is that she has this one night stand. She arrives at the, the estate for the engagement party and whoops, there's the guy that, you know, she just had the one night stand with. So um, it's a really, really fun read. And um, I thought the look into the um, Arab historical, um, the culture of the, um, of the Arabs in that period of history was really fascinating. So that would be my two recommendations. Well, thank you, everybody. I think we are well out of time at this point, although I could sit here and chat with you all for another couple of hours. Um, but thank you all for sharing so openly and being so, you know, such cheerleaders for the genre. This has been really terrific. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this panel, head over to our StoryFest 2020 playlist and check out the rest of our virtual author events. And for more information about StoryFest, visit the library's website at www.westportlibrary.org.